I've never done anything like this. I don't think I've ever been on camera in any sense. Um, I'm <laughs> in general, a very publicity shy person. Um, and so this is this is new for me. And I, I don't even know if there's a video record of me on the internet. I mean, there must be from meeting somewhere, but uh, it's nothing that I've actually ever voluntarily do. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three and coming to you live from Berlin at the IMR His meeting. It's such a great opportunity to be able to interview live, real persons instead of sitting behind a computer screen. And I'm very thrilled with today's guest on, our epi on this episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. This is a guy I met many years ago. He's been to South Africa before, but man, to try and nail him down and get a podcast with him because he lives on the other side of the world is almost impossible. So it's a real honor and a privilege to have Brian Wong on with us today. Brian, thank you so much. Well, likewise. Uh, I I've never done anything like this. I don't think I've ever been on camera in any sense. Um, I'm <laughs> in general, a very publicity shy person. Um, and so this is, this is new for me. And I don't even know if there's a video record of me on the internet. I mean, there must be from meeting somewhere, but uh, it's nothing that I've actually ever voluntarily do. Wow. So, which is funny. My wife works in television or did for many years. And it's, it's really, really, really funny in the sense that that's all she used to do. That's amazing. So, Brian, I mean, this is our third season. And it's amazing to me how this has taken off around the world. We've got nearly 100 countries that listen to the podcast. Wow. And I mean, we're teaching rhinoplasty to the world, and it's just such a cool tool to be able to do that. So tell the listeners, who are you? Where do you come from? Well, um, I'm a Southern Californian, and I grew up in Southern California, spent most of my life there. I spent a year in England uh, at the beginning of my medical studies, and then four more years in Baltimore at, at Hopkins. And since then, I've literally been at UC Irvine for every single stage of my training after that, from an intern to a resident to a chief resident to a fellow uh, to faculty. So uh, it's been a very long time. I've been in California all of my life, except for those five years away. That's crazy. And you, are you, you facial plastic surgery. Are you, are you ENT trained or plastic surgery trained? Uh, ENT trained. Okay. So in, in my day, it was a little bit different. In, so much has changed in contemporary surgical training in the United States, but uh, my training started in the aftermath of the pyramid system. Pyramid system was, as it sounds, kind of a knockout elimination process where yeah. you took 20 people and you ended up with a, a, a far smaller number. That had ended by the time I went through my training, but general surgical training in the United States was still a very important part of all surgical training. So you did two years of general surgical training, yeah. uh, of which is very morbid, a lot of critical care, a, a lot of uh, intensive care work, a lot of trauma work. Uh, and then you do four years of Odo, and yeah. then thereafter another year of facial plastic surgery. Very different now because now in the United States, uh, medical students become ENT residents. They do maybe two to three months of general surgery, a month of neurosurgery, a month of plastics, uh, wow. a month of emergency medicine, a month of uh, critical care, and that's it. Uh, so it's very different than, than I guess, uh, countries that um, are, are, say, uh, out of the, the, the Commonwealth tree, yeah. where uh, you, you spend time learning all elements of surgery. So I guess I'm probably in that tail end uh, of, of having reasonably comprehensive training in, in that way. Wow. So... Now, Brian, I know two, two of the passions that we share is, is education and meetings. You know, I mean, I, I re recall meeting you back years ago in the States, and you are so hard working with organizing meetings, <laughs> and then you just upped it and had this global facial plastic meeting as well. So tell the listeners about how you got into to meeting. Well, I had run meetings for my own department, and, and they'd been small and regional, and the meetings... Uh, centered around um, uh, around golf, so it actually goes to a South African, and in in the United States, um, uh, one of the founders of facial plastic surgery was a man, man named um, uh, Leslie Bernstein, who had actually trained in Johannesburg, yeah. he trained in otolaryngology and I think oral maxillofacial surgery. Bernstein came to the United States. He was uh, a chairman uh, at Iowa, I believe, or was uh, a, not a senior faculty member at the University of Iowa, introduced 
cleft palate, cleft rhinoplasty, cleft everything to that institution, in my understanding, brought that background to UC Davis in yeah. Sacramento. And for years, Bernstein um, had a course uh, in Maui and in Oahu in the Hawaiian Islands yeah. um, for years, years. And Bernstein ran it himself, first at UC Davis, and then when he went into private practice in Sacramento, Bernstein uh, uh, ran that course. It was an incredible course. It covered all aspects of otolaryngology. Yeah. Yeah. So about 15, 20 years ago, uh, he essentially passed the course over to my former chair, Roger Crumley, and we changed it a little bit. We felt that, uh, uh, why Hawaii? Let's do the continental United States. Let's focus on Southern California. We had a golf meeting. And so, so yeah. my background in meetings comes from taking over that meeting for Roger Crumley yeah, yeah. and having a sort of a pan ENT meeting. Um, and then, uh, that was going well, and I liked doing that, and, and it, it led to the opportunities to do uh, other meetings in otolaryngology, and then the other side of my life is, is that which is in biomedical engineering and biomedical optics, yes. and uh, I, I am part of a, a large meeting with 21,000 people, which yeah. I've been one of the chairs for for about 20 years now, and my particular track has about 3,000 uh, attendees and maybe about 1,500 talks. So I've had meeting experience then, but really the world changed with the pandemic, yeah. and and you changed it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, with with your 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 broadcasts, yes. uh, your podcasts, your webinars, it really, really, really just changed everything. And uh, our meeting, which was historically a golf meeting, it, it went virtual, in hundred percent inspired and derived from what you had started for yeah. rhinoplasty, yeah. and we we felt that well. We used, we used to have a meeting for 150 to 200 otolaryngologists that covered everything from plastics to otology uh, with speakers from all over the United States coming to talk and, and to a lesser extent the world. Um, and when that ended with the pandemic, it was, well, why, why don't we do this globally? Yes. Um, and that was also inspired by your World Rhinoplasty yeah, yeah, Day. Yeah. It's very similar. I think you, you created a chain uh, reaction That's where, awesome, where people... Man we're really inspired by yeah. it because I think your impact went beyond just rhinoplasty and no, plastic surgery. Yeah. There's other organizations that are doing the same thing that are following exactly yeah. your lead. You were the first. Yeah, but Brian, the other thing, listeners, you guys must really understand that Brian and I started chatting at the start of the pandemic and you guys came on board with UC Irvine to help with all our CME points. And it was amazing because that then spilled over to World Rhinoplasty as well. And obviously for World Rhinoplasty number two coming up next year, we're going to be chatting about that as well. Yeah, I, I, I think that I, I, it's just the right time. And yeah. it, it's transformed. I, I mean, the, the, the whole give have meetings via the Internet, have long format lectures via the Internet. It's changed things, yeah. which yeah. Yeah. which I wonder I'm asking right now, how, how are meetings different? I mean, well, why do we go to meetings? And I, I'm finding that I'm going to meetings because I want to meet people. Socially. I want to see f yeah. friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask questions that they, yeah. they wouldn't answer necessarily on a podium. You want to learn what people are really doing. And you have the opportunity for someone to sit down and draw out what they do on a piece of paper or show you the video that's on their computer. Yeah. So, so I think, though, that it, it has changed because, I mean, you, you pioneered this. I mean, giving these in, in, epic... Um, uh, it's probably overused, but sort of TED Talk type presentations. Yeah, yeah, you, you, get really your, cool, eh? <laughs> you get your your best speakers and say, you have an hour. And in the real world, there's maybe five people on the planet that a course director would give an hour to speak Absolutely. all at once. Absolutely. Yeah. Beyond that, there's yeah. there's so many other people that just would never get that time. Yeah, yeah. And you gave it to them yeah. with uh, with World Rhinoplasty Day, with, with your, your seminars, in a time when... We're all sitting at home hoping that the world didn't end, right? <laughs> I mean, literally, to think back, I mean, uh, 2020, March 2020, the world was going to end. Yeah. And and it didn't. And now we are. Yeah. Now, Brian, before we go more about rhinoplasty, I'm fascinated about your biomedical engineering. Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, well, I, I think it's, you know, the, the training in the United States for medicine is, is different. Yeah. Um, in that, in the U.S., uh, you finish your, your secondary education, high school, okay. and you go to university. And most people that pursue medicine have to do a first degree in like something a, like else. Like a science degree of three or four years. It, it, it actually doesn't. It's usually four years. And okay. it, it's 
the majority, 70% are in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, medicine. Yeah. 30% are not. They're from the humanities, from anything. Okay. They all have to have basic requirements in terms of coursework. Yeah, yeah. They have to take exams that show that they have adequate scientific background. Um, and and you know then they go on to medicine. And there are a small number of, of programs. Uh, I would imagine less than 100 positions where you can go straight out of uni- uh, high school into medicine. Uh, so it's a little different than oh, okay. uh, sort of the British uh, yeah, yeah. type of training. So my first degree w- was in engineering. Um, and wasn't exactly 100% certain that I wanted to go into medicine. Yeah. And my engineering degree led me to medical imaging at the birth of PET, at the birth of, well, definitely the birth of PET scanning, the birth of, of N- uh, MRI scanning. Yeah. All of that was brand new. Um, it was all the same mathematics as CT scanning. It was interesting. It was fascinating. It was lucrative. And when I applied to medical school, it was my mandate was, well, you know, why are you going to medical school? And my answer is, well, I, I want to run the imaging divisions at either GE or Siemens. Well, why do you want to go to medical school? And I said, well, uh, how can I build devices if I don't know what the problems are? Yeah. So don't I have to go to medical school and don't I have to be a radiologist yeah. to understand what physicians need, what are the problems, what's important, and match mm-hmm. the technology? So that was my mantra through most of medical school. And then uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, in those days, you, you would have some option to choose your clinical, your core clinical rotations in yeah. whatever sequence, and there's still a bit of magic and mystery to those sequences. Uh, what, what will get you the best scores and grades? And my answer was, I'm never going to be a surgeon. I'm going to do surgery first. It's the most brutal. I'll get it done. I'll learn a lot, and then I'll be able to do extremely well in the other core specialties because I would have learned everything. So I'm going to get surgery out of the way, and I'll take a lower score. And... Um, First thing I saw was uh, a surgeon who I believe is retired now, Robert McClario, doing uh, a pediatric parotidectomy with the facial nerve all displayed out, and I'm just in awe of his dissection techniques. Yeah. Next operation I see, a very, very morbid procedure, was laryngopharyngectomy with gastric pull-up, and, and it was, wow, this is especially I need to do. Yeah, yeah. And it just all flipped uh, for, for me, and, and that led me to led me to clinical medicine, it led me to surgery, and then um, facial plastic surgery was a very, very late decision for me. It became, we did six years of training in my time. It was a decision at the end of my fifth year of training uh, to do that. I was uh, absolutely, I I wanted to be Douglas Maddox, who uh, was chairman at the University of uh, of uh, Emory University, and before that he was at Johns Hopkins, who was my mentor. Yeah. Dr. Maddox would do a tympanoplasty, then he'd do a, a lateral skull base for an acoustic, then he'd do anesthesioblastoma, then he'd split the mandible and take out a tongue base tumor, and then he'd do, take a, a forearm flap out, and uh, myself and probably dozens of other medical students of that time wanted to be Douglas Maddox, and I wanted to do that yeah, for yeah. all my residency, uh, until about the fifth year, when when I re- I, I, I just did not find uh, skull base uh, as interesting and I did find, I actually still love head and neck, although I haven't done a head and neck case in 25 years, but I think the morbidity of head and neck started to weigh on me. And yeah, you yeah, start yeah. seeing what yeah. happens to your patients yeah. three, four, five years out, and it, it changes your perspective. At the same time, uh, surrounded by incredible mentors that were doing the whole breadth of facial plastic surgery. I mean, from rhinoplasty to free flaps to trauma to Mohs reconstruction. So. Uh, I think I probably came more from the skull base, head and neck mm-hmm. interest. Um, I know people come into rhinoplasty and facial plastic surgery through um, in, in otolaryngology, that is a lot through rhinology, uh, but I came through sort of the head and neck tumor skull base side of it. Uh, but that went away from my interest in the end of residency. Uh, and then it was, and then it was a lot of, of trauma and reconstruction. Uh, and then eventually rhinoplasty became larger and larger part of my yeah, practice. Yeah. So, but the engineering never went away. Yeah. It was always there. And what is it in engineering at the moment? Well, I, my, my interest has always been uh, in optics. And it's, yes. a, it's a, a seminal year that I spent w- uh, in, in, in Oxford uh, at Wolfson um, where I got exposed to optics. And, and at that moment, I mean, just uh, crystallizing the idea that, well, the future is in light. And I still think that the future is in light. It, it's yeah. moved from therapeutic to diagnostic. Um, but there is just so much happening with light. So I, I 
am at an optics institute. Uh, my work is in biomedical optics. I use optics in, in terms of imaging for my basic work. So I think that that's the core interest that I have. And the other interest that I have is in tissue reshaping, looking at tissue as a plastic, not as a plastic surgeon, but materials are plastic. In, in other words, they're polymers, they undergo deformation. If you change the chemical state, if mm -hmm. you change the, the environmental conditions, the properties of the tissue change. So can we alter tissue and make plastic deformations? The weird thing is that it's led me to ophthalmology research and also a lot of dermatologic research, which is a thousand miles away from rhinoplasty, yeah, but, yeah. but it's interesting. So I, I'm lucky I get to wear these two hats. Uh, this is a rhinoplasty podcast. Where's no, the no, this is about podcast? everything. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's okay. amazing to hear. And guys, I don't know if you know about it, but when Brian sent me a CV because he came out to South Africa to talk, I don't know, we needed it for a, a, a visa or something. I nearly burst out laughing because it was pages and pages and pages. And I think possibly he's published more than almost, I'd hate to say it, maybe the whole ENT community in South Africa. <laughs> that's, that's funny. No, I, it's just that I've had these two hats that I wear. And yeah. I think it's, I mean, you're, you're an, an, an Olympian and you're, I mean, people probably don't know about that. And uh, I've had friends uh, and well, not friends, I've had patients because we have a, uh, our university is very strong in Olympic water sports, yeah, so yeah. swimming and yeah. water polo and, and uh, things of that nature. It's a, an Olympic sport university rather than a, a money sport university. Yeah. And I realize how hard it is to do that. And it, it, it's sort of like your dual life that nobody knows about yeah. is competing or having competed at this high level. Yeah, I know yeah, that yeah. you wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and run, uh, you know, <laughs> 15 kilometers uh, to do that. So my, yeah. my sort of bifurcation in terms of avocation and vocation is that I have this split between um, science, as it were, and medicine. Yeah, yeah. And when one weighs heavy on the soul, the other one exists there. Some people play golf. Um, other people, uh, you know, have their hobbies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it just happens that my my hobbies, um, my avocations and vocations split. And yeah. there are definite days uh, that being a physician is hard and soul crushing. And there are definite days when being a scientist is exactly the Absolutely, same thing. Yeah. So it's my my switch off. And yeah, I think yeah. that if I didn't do that, then I'd, I'd probably have some sort of outdoor sport or yeah, yeah. some esoteric hobby and making yeah. model ships in a bottle or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but Brian, this is fascinating. So nice chatting to you. There is one last thing I want to kind of touch on um, is how far are we from kind of being able to 3D customize print noses? Because oh, yeah. it's, I, I think it's going to be the future at a stage, but goodness me, the, the complexity of a nose, the 3D movement, the, the muscles, the skin, the cartilage, the bone, it's, I don't know, what do, what do you think about that? Where, where do you think this is going? I think about a year. So really? Yeah, I, I think, well, I, I would, let me back away from that statement that um, I, in the smallest possible ways, collaborate um, with an incredible team of, of scientists at UC Irvine um, the, the, the names are Kerry Atanasio and Wendy Brown. Yeah. And um, they, they have, they're, they're, and I, I don't want to say printing noses, but printing cartilage at least, which would be 90% of the battle, right? Yeah, absolutely. So they, they have, uh, well, Kerry has been uh, a stalwart in uh, orthopedic biomechanics for decades. Um, he's an endowed professor at my institution. Before that, he was an endowed professor at UC Davis. Before that, he was an endowed professor uh, at Rice University. And uh, he makes cartilage. And he can take a single contracite and expand it 10 times, 10 generations, without it losing phenotype. Um, and it, it, he's, he's commercialized this. It's developed. And uh, you know, he, he uh, moved to UC Irvine and you know, he, if, if you're smart and you have good ideas and you're in medicine, your best friend is an anatomy book and you have to figure out every single idea you have, you have to look at every page of the anatomy book and ask yourself, where can this technology impact this anatomic structure yeah. or physiology book? So yes, where else is there cartilage? Well, airway and the nose, right? And if you, th you think about, well, in the ear, um, what, what are the what are the, the the needs of cartilage there, and what is something that you could bring to market? Well, the answer is the nose. So um, 
he and, and one of his colleagues, Wendy Brown, uh, who's actually gone to many of our meetings. Wendy has been to has been to um, a, a, a lot of these uh, rhinoplasty meetings. Yeah. Um, they're they're growing cartilage and uh, they're using fetal tissues and. Um, you know, the, the only thing stopping them, well, there are two things stopping them. One is philosophical and one is regulatory. The regulatory issues on growing cartilage are evolving in the United States. And I, I mean, they can do it now. It's just a question of what, what, who will undertake the finances to do that regulatory process. And the second thing I think is philosophical. And, um, you know, I, the, when they asked me, my first question was antigenicity and rejection. Uh, we're taking something out of one body and putting it into another, even if it's neonate or, or, or uh, embryonal stem cell, I'm not sure if I have the terminology correct, derived. Mm. What about antigenicity? And um, they said, well, I don't know. You know, it, it's a privileged place. And I said, well, it's a privileged place in, in the joints, but you also have rheumatoid arthritis. So, you know, how does that work? Um, and then uh, they asked, well, what about cartilage uh, that's homograph? And I said, that's a good point. And I've never been able to get a straight answer for why don't you get or do you get an immune response to fresh frozen rib cartilage, to a radiated homograph, to uh, you know, formalin preserved. We're putting cartilage from cadaver sources through a number of different processing techniques into the human nose. And uh, they're not being rejected in the same way mm. that uh, 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 other things uh, would be transplanted in the body requiring immunosuppression, right? Mm. I, I mean, there, there are patients where, yeah, you use cadaver because they're 70 years old, because they're calcified, because they don't want a chest incision. You use cadaver cartilage. And I, I think on your podcast, uh, Rod has talked about fresh, fresh frozen yeah, cartilage. Yeah. And the antigens are there. They don't go away. They're there. Cells are dead, but the antigens are there. They're stable proteins. So, so I think that we're pretty close in answering to your question. It's, it's, the technology is ripe. Um, yes, the strength yes. is there. They can get cartilage now, and, and, and this group at, at Irvine and others, I, I think, can get the elastic modulus, the mechanical values. Because that's, that's the key thing. I mean, yeah. the, just, just the lower laterals, the difference between like the medial crura yeah. and the lateral crura is so different to the septum. Yeah. I think it's going to be fascinating if they can do it. I, I think the neat thing would be, one, I mean, um, a dorsal implant and a spreader graft, those would be like the first things that I would make. I mean, yeah. uh, because there's a, a need for that already. Yeah, if, you, yeah. if you made a cartilage dorsal implant, you've eliminated silicone and hopefully have eliminated uh, infection and retrusion yes, rates. Yes, yes, yes. And then spreader grafts, again, they, they aren't structural as well in, this, in the same extent that, say, a strut graph is yeah. or uh, or a septal extension what, what i always have advocated is that you know we, we dig a hole when we do an smr and remove a cartilage graph we ought to be filling it we ought to be filling it with something and it, it makes me wonder should we take a little bit of ear cartilage before we operate on a patient and expand it and create a sheet of cartilage that's their own tissue and i'm sure this would be expensive operate on their nose and put this sheet of cartilage that's their own derived cartilage back in. And because uh, we know... And how many fewer septal perforations? Yeah. How, how many revisions do people have? I mean, what's the revision rate? I mean, uh, I, I suspect wow. that revision rates for, uh, for, for good surgeons are probably between 2 and 7%. Yeah. For the occasional surgeon, it's probably 10 to 15. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you, you should plan on a revision because of those single digit numbers they're, they're not small mm. they're not 0.1% so. yeah, absolutely yeah. so i think we're close yes. i think we're really close guys i hope you understand why i love chatting to brian it's, it's so inspiring i mean he's, he's yeah last question if the listeners want to come to the states and come and attend some of these meetings how do they get hold of you or are there websites they must go to what's the best way of being able to get cuz i did the foundation of my training was in the states right um, and how can listeners get to come to these meetings? I, th I think a lot of countries require a letter for a visa, right? Yeah. So most of the parent organizations have uh, an administrative person that can handle it. I think with the AAFPRS, for example, uh, the next rhinoplasty meeting uh, is going to be uh, in, in the spring in Orlando in 2024. I, I think that it's very straightforward to get a letter generated. And I believe every society has that mm. as well. I'll be a big part of uh, the planning of that spring meeting. Uh, it, it will be in Orlando. Uh, don't know the exact structure. 
it's different now in that post-pandemic, uh, that rhinoplasty meeting, the Chicago rhinoplasty meeting, as it were, is now combined with aging face. Yeah. So it's interesting because uh, a lot of people say, well, I, I'm not really all that interested in the rhinoplasty meeting, but I'm interested in, in more about facelifts and injectables. Yeah. And others will say, well, I'm, I'm interested in, in, I'm not really interested in facelifts and injectables because I'm really good at them. I'm going to go to the rhinoplasty one instead. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of different. And it, it makes it more of a zoo. Yeah. Uh, but I think people can navigate through that. Awesome. Guys, if you want to get hold of Brian, the man is stepping out to the social media world. He is now on Instagram. <laughs> so make sure you follow him on Instagram. I think I have six posts now. Oh, that's and great. And like seven followers. So. <laughs> but Brian, on behalf of everybody from around the world, thank you so much for being on the show today. And oh, thank you for your time and thank you for your dedication for literally global teaching in facial plastic yeah. surgery. It's thank you, but really, I mean, and everybody that is doing these type of things, they point to you and your South African organization, you you really, uh, you tilted the entire axis of the earth. I'm, <laughs> I'm not even joking on that, that, oh. that whenever anyone's asking me about this, I said, it's this is not my idea. This is his idea. Yeah. He saw a thousand feet ahead of, in front of everyone else that, you know, the, the future of medical education is going to have uh, this format. Yeah, it's going yeah. to be incorporated into yeah. it. And we, we write a paper on that. It was cool. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Brian, thanks. Guys, All thank right. you for listening and um, tune in again next week for another episode.